to be here today. Um, I admit, like, uh, I feel unprepared. Um, so I'm going to start first by saying um, that um, I, I don't come with, like, a doctorate. Um, I'm not, um, I don't claim to be, like, a knowledge keeper or um, <clears throat> I don't have, like, um, complete, like, knowledge and authority of um, what it means to um, understand like any indigenous perspective but um, I am a part of um, that indigenous perspective so the first thing I'm going to say is everything that I speak about today um, has nothing to do with Jesus um, also what I'm going to speak about today is not from an institution um, and also what I'm going to speak about today is not um, implemented by like any form of governance um, I, <clears throat> I want to appreciate everybody for coming here today. I know, uh, in the last few months, the, there's been a lot of, um, what do you call that hard, uh, um, realities that we face, you know, a lot of things have been amplified. So in that, I just want to say, um, I appreciate everyone for being here and I would like people to, um, I would like people to, um, uh, consider all the stuff that you're doing. I know we're all busy, everyone's multitasking. And um, honestly, I think most people who black out their screens is because we're on air in their room, <laughs> like radio show uh, while they're doing their work. Uh, so yeah, I just, I'll do a little exercise with you guys and then we'll go into my short film and um, I'll see you guys on the other side of that film. But um, for now, all of those, um, you know, measurements that I just talked about of knowledge um, with religion and government and our work and schedule and time like that. I want you to, you know, consider all those things in your mind and just, you know, place them um, in a container, like kind of just think about that and just put them there for now. Um, all those things that you bring forward. Um, the, this, this discussion isn't going to be about uh, or Inuhatirinik. Um, and anytime our conversation starts to go in that direction um, where uh, it becomes either like skewed towards political ideas or uh, what makes somebody um, their identity, we'll move forward pretty quick. Um, and also at any point in time, you feel like there's a part of you that you want to introduce again um, and apply it to um, the whatever discussion that we're going to be having, um, uh, please do. Um, and this, uh, this community that we have today um, is not going to be solely from my experience and my knowledge. You know, this is going to be a practice for um, all of us to um, apply ourselves. Um, as an Inuk myself, um, you know, I identify as Inuk because I know this may sound irrational to some other cultures, but it's because I feel like um, I identify with a collective conscience of people. So unless we share together, uh, how do I know what um, the people I identify with are doing? That is my of uh, my identity. So I'll start with a little a little song um, <clears throat> to help people find themselves um, clearing that clutter of um, you know um, who we think we are, or what we think we know, or um, what gives us the right to think we are or what gives us the right to think we know. So I'll just start with a little song to put those away and have us start um, as a community council, you know, and that's what we're going to do today. And that's how we're going to transfer and understand skills and knowledge um, and then um, use the environment to um, measure what we're really saying. So if you guys just want to just relax, take a breath. <sighs> Hey. 
Hi everybody. <laughs> so um, maybe we'll get to the short film and um, when we come um, past the short film, uh, I look forward to uh, starting um, our view of uh, what we're going to be using today as a Canadian Shield um, and start discussing different, um, um, uh, what do you call that, like variants of um, how the environment, the ecosystems, landscapes, and um, you know, constituted identities, um, and uh, and how you know etiquette has like formed through our relationship with uh, the environment, or not like disrupted relationships with the environment. Um, like I said, the conversations today will not be from uh, and and that means like governing people or um, how we're related anytime the conversations go into that direction where um, it becomes you know an attempt to skew somebody else's identity or understanding we'll move forward pretty quick so again I'm gonna repeat uh, <laughs> this um, webinar cannot be um, complete without um, people um, trying to express what they understand. Uh, so stick your head out there and uh, I promise we'll only make fun of you so that we can all learn from it. <laughs> so if you want to go ahead, Paige, and um, play the short film. Yeah, so I tested this um, just a few minutes ago and I think the best way to share the video is not to put it in full screen. So I will just share it to see how it goes oh wait um <laughs> we're practicing beforehand okay i'm gonna share the computer sound as well so you should be able to hear the video pretty well um can you see vimeo thumbs up yeah okay i'm gonna press play <laughs> My name is Kevin Tickety. I was born in Iqaluit, Nunavut. When I was born, I looked at the men and women around me and knew exactly who I wanted to be. Like many young boys around me, to become a great hunter was my goal. The men and women I speak of were hunters, wives, husbands, aunts, uncles, sisters, brothers, daughters, <laughs> sons, granddaughters, and grandsons, as far back as my language and namesake could be spoken. My language comes from these places so connected to the land. You see, in the beginning, there was the land, and it is the source of my language, to which I owe every part of my being. Second were the seasons and moon. We do not count the number of birthdays. We recognize how many cycles we have lived through acknowledging the winters we have experienced. Third are the regions, realizing the landscape and its relationship to the land, season, and moon. With regard to the hills, rivers, terrains, oceans, lakes, and how they are affected by the seasons and moons, we come to our decision and move forward to meet our needs. Fourth, is in acknowledging the territories, the ideas of territories that are not identified by the ownership of the land, because we believe you cannot own the land, seasons, and regions. Rather, we acknowledge the inhabitants and the etiquette they inherit from the land, seasons, and regions. This is not limited to only to the idea of humans, but rather with regard to all the animals that live on those parts. We offer respect and gain acceptance this way. After explaining our relationships and history, we move forward with the stories we share, learning where the animals are and who else may be around. Fifth are the people and the cultures we carry. With respects to the land, seasons, regions, and territories, do we only begin to understand the culture of the territories. With this knowledge, we decide to look at ourselves and how we can relate. Here, you begin to apply the history of your name and the knowledge you carry, all in respects to the harmony of what I speak of. Today, I'm so far removed from this way of life. Never did I think when I was first introduced into this world how far I would be taken away. The lands have become property, the seasons an economic linear measurement. The regions with all the hills, rivers, oceans, lakes 
have become aisles in a grocery store. Through this transition in my short life of 35 years, I have experienced all the statistical factors of Indigenous men in Canada. This has led to being diagnosed with complex post-traumatic stress disorder. By the time I was 16, over 10 people close to me have committed suicide. These were my friends and family. By now, there have been over 20 and counting. In my early 20s, I began to cope with drugs and alcohol. When I was 25, I was sentenced to five years in prison. It wasn't until I began to remember the knowledge I was given. I almost forgot my namesake. I began to read the weather once again and started following those paradigms I speak of. Through the Algonquins, Mohawks, Mi'kmaq, and the Etikamat, I began to return to my ancestral etiquettes of sharing and learning from other Indigenous people. Today I try my best to remodel my internal self to better communicate my knowledge. I have learned that my life became lost in translation from one world to this one. I have begun to understand the duty of carrying my true name, Akhilajai. The practice I recommend, if the story relates to you, is to learn to love yourself, take care of your body, be prepared, create an income, and be kind and welcoming to others as you move forward. Transfer the stories and knowledge of our ancestors to the children. It's not about the fall. This story is about the rise. Whether you have succumbed to substances, been displaced, become incarcerated, abused, depressed, scooped up and adopted, I want you all to know you are not alone, and that there are prayers in the wind dating back to the first words of your ancestors. Um, like I said, my name is uh, Kevin Tikovic. Um, yeah, I uh, originally um, thought I would be giving this um, or um, being a part of this webinar um, on the land and talking about the, uh, the Canadian Shield and learning a little bit about how um, um, the environment here has like uh, grown. And, through the years. Uh, today I was walking for like 40 minutes um, along the Ottawa River and um, you know it, 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 I woke up this morning and I, I realized like I feel completely unprepared to um, share such a space of what later I found out to be um, very exclusive you know? and you know the fears that I have that um, I won't transfer uh, what the elders have asked me to do um, when I was a young boy. So, you know, I was walking for, you know, 40 minutes and I'm like, well, this is kind of fitting, you know, like there's absolutely no um, space <laughs> um, to um, to show like the, the literature of nature, you know, like tracking or finding a moose bed or, um, you know, game trails and stuff like that. But I was walking and then, you know, I, I heard the crows, they were like squawking. And so I was like, all right, cool. Like there's something going on here. So I come here and I find there's a hundred, I'm, I'm on a spot where there's like a hundred feet between two mansions <laughs> and that's nature. It's a park. Um, but, uh, you know, I set up my stuff and I prepared myself um, and I observed the, the two crows and they were picking bugs and I realized, okay, I'm next to a river um, that's <clears throat> um, impacted by uh, human activity. Um, so the water levels um, rise and fall um, in a different uh, punctuation because of the locks and stuff like that. So I'm in a spot where um, the water goes up and down a lot um, and in these areas you'll find a lot of um, you know, uh, insect life. So um, yeah, I found myself 
maybe 50 feet away from a crow's nest, you know? So, uh, and crows are interesting. I don't know much about them, but um, they work in like the family value, it seems like. I'm just learning this. And I, again, like what I'm going to say is not um, going to be like um, the standard, but <clears throat> yeah, so they, uh, they pick their bugs and go feed their babies. <laughs> Um, and it's because the water constantly rises and falls. And I guess that's like a really good breeding ground for insects. So these are the, um, this is the literature of, 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 uh, nature that I hope we can, um, interact with each other today. Uh, it's very important that, uh, you participate, um, because these, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, these ways have been um, a part of our identity. It's, it's what makes me believe that I'm human, um, is that I believe that we have this collective identity and um, we can speak about, you know, observations that we have and, you know, because humans are intelligent um, and we have extremely creative minds, it, if we feed each other like knowledge that we observe and talk about, um, it's going to be really easy to, um, to inform and speak and, and create this, uh, um, you know, uh, a confident identity of who we are. Um, so I appreciate everyone for being here today. Um, I guess like to remind everybody, we're going to be using the um, Canadian shield as a, as like our you know reason to have this discussion um i guess first like what i want people to do is uh, i have like a couple windows put up uh, i don't know if you guys have a mac but uh it's really cool because you can put you could create two screens and um so uh so the first like uh, map that i want people to look at like if you look at google earth and stuff and um just Take a look at, uh, well, first of all, take a look at like the uh, region of the Canadian Shield. Um, and that uh, encompasses like so many, so many ecosystems and watersheds and lakes um, and mountain regions. Um, to start I, from what like geologists know, um, the Canadian Shield is like approximately like 3 billion years old. Um, that's like, really a long time but in reality it's actually really young um so if you notice uh, the size of the trees down here and this is what i've been learning um i didn't know nothing about trees like growing up i never saw a tree until i was eight but um the yeah so the canadian shield is fairly young and um its character has been um created through glaciers and different um uh, environmental impacts uh, so here you won't find trees that are um, enormous, you know, like uh, in the Rockies or something like that. You know, you hear of those uh, red cedars that, you know, they cut a hole through it and you could actually drive <laughs> through a tree. That's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, you'll see that in the Canadian Shield, the reason why the trees aren't um, that big is because the, um, the depth of the soil is not that... Uh, um, deep so trees can only grow so long and quite often when you're on hiking trails and stuff like that in Canadian Shield you'll find trees toppled over but also there's areas where um, I've hiked before um, in the Arctic where um, because of the way that the glaciers and settlement have happened the soil content is much higher next to a river and in the Arctic you have like 20 foot trees you know um, these micro ecosystems that are like five degrees warmer than like what's over the hill. Um, sorry, the, the screen's kind of throwing me off. Uh, oh, I could pick, who am I looking at or? I, I'm, I'm looking at one person licking envelopes and I'm trying to talk. <laughs> <laughs> there is a gallery view, <laughs> um, the top right corner. There's yeah. a grid that you click on that switches into gallery view so you can see everyone hopefully. Yeah. So, okay. I'll keep, I'll keep going. Uh, so like, you know, in, in these micro, um, ecosystems and environments, like it's, it's five degrees warmer in, um, just over the hill. So, and, and then you get to see how, um, the environment, um, 
starts to change and um, and uh, become its own character and and uh, also um, the kind of wildlife and, and humans and uh, cultures and etiquettes that um, have evolved from these um, beautiful um, natural um, relationships and reactions to, to, to our lives. So today, uh, if we're gonna talk about um, the Canadian Shield, maybe um, as in like a honor to the Toronto Indian Association, um, I would like to start with like the, the Great Lakes. Um, and to start, if any Toronto Inuit um, would like to just uh, talk about um, some of the kind of things that um, they've been doing uh, in relationship to um, their community. Like, what kind of stuff are you guys doing in the city so that we could understand um, how we interact in, in these urban environments and stuff like that. And um, yeah, so if anybody wants to introduce themselves again and talk about, um, you know, Toronto, say what's up. I don't know. <laughs> Um, before we do that, I was wondering if you could answer one of Alepika's questions. Yeah. Um, it's in the chat. My Nixtoot pronunciation is really bad. Um, but I think when you were introducing yourself, you were saying Akalija. What yeah. So, um, <clears throat> yeah. So it's, it's nice these days that like, um, colonizers, um, will say stuff like, <clears throat> Well, you know, that wasn't uh, me. That was like my great grandparents. You know, I didn't do anything with that. You know, and, and, it, and it's a very easy way for um, such a ideology that's constituted to uh, remove themselves from um, what they're uh, adding to um, our, our community. So it's really nice too when people do like uh, um, land claims uh, or unceded territory acknowledgements and stuff like that. And I have friends too that are like, yeah, but what's your real name, you know? Or I've had other people say like, yo, what's your totem animal? I'm like, me, fuck, like I'm my totem animal, you know? Like that's me right here. They're like, yeah, but like what's really your... So I, I get it, like we, we're all trying, you know? And some of the words I might say might um, uh, might, might hit a stroke in, in, in your identity that's gonna be a little bit stiff, but um, you know, a few people have tried to say Akalajai, but they can't say it. So, you know, like they think it's like cool to be like, hey, Aki or whatever. Um, but that's part of my identity, you know. Um, I almost forgot my name. And Akalajai comes from um, someone who was here before me. And when I was born, I had a daughter. Uh, her name was uh, uh, Khiluya. And, you know, she back then she was rumored to, you know, well, when she passed away, I learned rumors that, you know, there, she was rumored to have had two husbands, like one in the shadow world and one who was uh, in this world, uh, who was a great hunter. And, you know, from a young age, Akhalajai um, was taught to be a leader, you know, um, and it's not like leader, like, hey, I'm going to take these people to the future of the world, you know, like, often I was asked to, um, you know, I was asked like, hey, what are we going to do tomorrow, and, you know, me as you saw in the video who want to be the greatest hunter in the world i'm like everything that has to do with guns and knives and my rope and like you know doing like really cool stuff and to be a great guy uh, so i would pick like seal hunting or caribou hunting or or whatever but as i got older these questions were a little bit more complicated because um it meant that it was a measurement of your awareness of your environment so if my, I think I, until I was like eight years old, I would ask my grandfather, Mali, Mali, Mali. Mali means like, you know, um, to follow. Um, before they go hunting, I would say stuff like that. And he would just tell me, that means like people can't follow hunting. You can't go following someone hunting. And then when I was about eight, I learned that I was saying the wrong word. And I would say, Ilau. That means, can I be a part of the hunting? See, little things like that. Um, and so I was eight years old and 
I said the right word. I regretted it after, but um, <laughs> so we went caribou hunting in that year. Um, we had to walk far inland. Um, I went with Mitu uh, Salakunuk, Sami Peter, and my grandfather. Uh, we went far, and it's been, it was like three months since we had caribou meat because it was spring, um, and there's a time in there where uh, the snow goes away, the ice breaks up, and then the land, you know, thaws out. So there's like, you know, in each of these seasons, there's different um, uh, behaviors and um, challenges to um, hunting. So we went and we ended up walking really far. And uh, we, you know, the three men who are, in my idea, the epitome of that spirit that I think of when people say the word hunter. And they had to, you know, have a discussion like we are today um, about whether or not they're going to go further to catch this caribou. Um, and so anyways, in the end, we did because uh, we caught the caribou and they gave me the front small leg and we were far and like, I, like they just kept getting further and further and further away from me. But every once in a while, it was the time when they came out with the butane lighters. I would see my uncle Methuselah light a cigarette and I would see a little glow in the distance and you could tell like my butt cheeks were clink clinched i'm like scared that there are wolves behind me and like i'm trying to catch up to the elders like these were real things so yeah my name's Ajay, um and it comes from a real um i can't say painful but it comes from a real fear that um i won't transfer these ways of um educating you know like why wouldn't my grandfather just tell me to say the right word? Why would they ask me every day what I want to do the next day? You know, instead of just telling me, hey, you have to learn how to read the weather. Do we have to adjust the boat in a different direction to understand the wind? Do we have to figure um, that it's a seasonal thing? So it's fall, you know, and the women want to go berry picking. Um, and we're going to have to leave a young man with a gun to protect them from the polar bears while the men go seal hunting so that they could bring back a seal because the women love putting their berries with the fat of the seal and eating the blood you know so you know like who am i to try to figure out how to articulate um these skills and knowledge and transfer them you know in relationship to the environment it's uh <clears throat> that's archaeology it's a very uh <clears throat> yeah it's 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 a big part of my identity that um doesn't come out very well in in in, in the in the identity of kevin tickle right so so how do, how do I do that? I don't know. We're doing that right now. And that's why it's so important for everyone here to participate and talk about uh, stuff that they're doing. And so, yeah, welcome to transferable skills and knowledge and the environment. Fuck, like, why me? <laughs> you know, shit. So, yeah, right. Toronto, what's up? Talk about it. Like, what are you guys doing in your community? What are things that are happening? Like, you guys are setting up this platform that's really beautiful. And this is part of that knowledge that i'm talking about you're here so if you guys want to introduce yourself again and, and um say some of the cool things that um you've been wanting to do you know or um however your relationships are with inuit um and uh yeah if somebody would like to speak from toronto sheena you're involved in this like i've seen you back home you know what's up so if anybody wants to say anything I'm just waiting for like Sheena or Brian to talk. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's scary eh, to like put yourself out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I want to say, first of all, like you're, you're doing a great job. Thank you so much. Um, it's, it is a big title, but I think you're, you're putting it on well. So thank you for this. <laughs> um, I don't know if I'm the best person to talk about like what Toronto's doing. Um, I know Brian has been involved a lot with, uh, I guess right now we have like two different levels. There's the, the kind of um, 
frontline work where we're helping people out during COVID, um, yeah. making sure that people have food and that they're safe and healthy. Um, so he and Sheena have been involved quite a bit with that. And then I'm doing more of the online stuff. So it's pretty exciting that we're able to connect with people, not just in Toronto, but across Ontario, across Canada, across like without borders, we can share, share knowledge with everyone. Um, so it's been really, really nice uh, doing these workshops and we have done like a lot of craft style workshops, but Inuit identity is so much more than that. Like it is a big part of it and I'm really happy for our craft workshops too, but I think it's so great that we can spend time with you and, and we can hear about different parts of our identity. And I think, um, People in Toronto are really lacking that like outdoor space, the time to just like go into nature and kind of turn off, turn off your city brain, just hear the wind through the trees and stuff. So yeah, I think um, our Toronto folks are going to be really happy with this. And I am rambling, so I don't know if somebody else wants to talk. <laughs> go ahead. That's really, that's really good. I, you know, these are the skill sets that we have to start talking about, you know, like, you know, organizations and political um, groups and stuff like that. They're afraid to use the word like traditional now, you know, like that's like, you don't mention that shit anymore, you know, but Paige, what I acknowledge from you is that your, your ability to work really fast. Um, I like the idea that you're creating content to um, direct people, you know, um, and that is as traditional as um, the different variables of making a Inukshuk so that people can be guided to where we're supposed to do stuff, you know? Um, something as simple as trail markers, comments, or like posters or whatever. These are all like transferable skills. So, you know, people are like, well, how come there's so many different types of Inukshuks and stuff like that, you know? And um, the simple answer is like when you're hiking in the trails, like, or when you're back home, sometimes it's just a little rock and you have to be able to tell the difference between a rock that was placed by glacier movement and a rock that was placed by a human. And once you figure that out, it's like really simple to figure out like, you know, that you're on the trail, but half of you is doubting you're on the right trail, you know? So, but Inukshuk's evolve um, depending on um, how, um, sufficient the um, resources are like food and water and um, shelter and boat space and stuff like that so the closer you are to a camp the more you know complex a nookshuk would be because um, people had more time there to to um, work on that nookshuk right so that would be a tell that um, inuli. that means there are people here you know and that means there are uh, these you know resources that we need like the Toronto Inuit Association so if you look at different Inuit groups and stuff like that, you could see how um, um, intricate their Inukshuks are, or in this case, someone like yourself um, and the flyers and the page and like all of this like transfer of like gathering of people that we do. Um, and that's a tell for our community that, hey, the Toronto Inuit's here, what's up, you know? So Brian, you wanna talk a little bit about like um, what it's like to be a boss? I, I certainly wouldn't call myself the boss. Um, and, and speaking of tradition, we, uh, we try and do it as much as we can by consensus. So um, my boss is our board um, and our collective boss is our community. Um, but actually, I, I will point out that, that Simon did want to share. Um, so I'm going to defer to Simon right now. Not going to make. Hello. My name, is, my name is Simon, and uh, I'm, I'm originally from Rankin Inlet, but I live in Toronto. And like, uh, what I want to share today is, uh, I, I was, I, I was promoted to do a huge project for a, a private company called Cam H, and I was lucky. I was able to make big sculptures out of piles, and now like, uh, what that. It represents my other Inuit people and like from 
different different people and also different people. And like uh, I'm part of myself, but also at the same time, I'm glad I can reflect on other people's point of view. And like uh, my art, like it represents other Inuit people and myself because uh, I'm glad I was able to do this project. And like uh, I was successful because I was working with people and it was it was kind of like a, a long journey. It was kind of a journey and I liked it. And like it made me feel very proud of myself also. It just shows that Inuit people are like, we, we have talent, like I'm glad I have a talent. Also, all the new people have talent. It's very special, I could say. And like, uh, that's all I want to share. And like, and now they're putting up my sculptures, like the tiles. They put, they put, they put, they installed it actually in a new hospital. So like, uh, that's all I want to share for this group for now. And uh, thank you for letting me share. And I'm glad to be here. And also with Kevin, the, the stories are very interesting. I like listening to them. So cool. Thank you. Um, great, Brian, uh, great example. And uh, Simon, like, thank you so much. It's, it's true, like that, that's another example of how um, the environment and, um, uh, and our identity and community are so intricate, you know, like, uh, we get caught up so much on, um, you know, <clears throat> what defines an Inuk blood quantum and, um, you know, different, uh, uh, you know, ethnic identities that um, make you a distinct people in the eyes of uh, governments, you know, and it's so easy to um, not be a complete one. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's, 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 it's really difficult to, to say that, but I was really impressed with Brian because, like, a real boss, he's like, let my community speak, you know? <laughs> so, like, these are real traits. So, here we are, transferable skills and knowledge. And so, now, this is how it starts to begin. Um, uh, so, the next thing I want to do is just maybe if people can, um, you know, I don't know if, like, uh, we're all getting used to this platform. Uh, and Paige, uh, we're going to rely on you a lot, apparently. Um, but uh, if we could look at like Google Maps or like a topography map or something for everyone uh, of Canada. And then we'll start there uh, and focus on the Great Lakes area, uh, especially around Toronto. Um, and, uh, and then we'll start to understand like... Um, <clears throat> why uh those lakes are so huge um i used to have dogs that would go to school in st catherine's i think it's like four hours past toronto south and there's this bridge i think they call it a sky bridge like it's fitting like you go on this huge 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 bridge and i remember telling myself like this lake is so big so big that like I thought it was like, it, it, could, it might as well be an ocean. I couldn't see the other side. And I was really impressed with that. Um, so how did these lakes get so humongous? Um, if you zoom out a little bit, you start to see these mountain regions, all right? And these are gonna be our trails um, through this discussion. So these mountains, um, depending on um, their uh, steepness, um, will uh, create different um, ecosystems. So if you have um, a section that is really steep, um, a mountain region that's really steep, the angle's really high, uh, and then all of a sudden at the bottom it's flat, you'll find like marshy areas, you know? And so like, yeah, so like you could see those areas where it goes like really dark green and then suddenly super light green to me, that tells me that these kinds of regions will have like a lot of marshy areas next to a river bank, you know? Uh, and when you look at that, you start to consider like, well, what kind of, uh, uh, what kind of ecosystem are we talking about? So in the Canadian Shield, you know, like we said, um, it's either settlement or very young earth. So the trees don't grow as big. So when you get into these marshy areas, I start to think, hmm, 
maybe moose, what kind of fish? You know, what kind of, what kind of seasons do these animals follow? So when you start walking in these areas and when you're um, on those like uh, trails, those groomed trails, you'll always see this like little hint of an opening and it's usually no more than like a foot, a foot and a half. And that's like, that's your tell. Just stare at it for like a couple minutes and all of a sudden you're on a game trail. Follow that. <laughs> but if you get eaten by a bear, like this is a disclaimer, the Toronto Inuit Association is not <laughs> responsible for you getting eaten. So here we are. Now we're in these watersheds, uh, which is a big part of um, the, 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 the behavior of, of nature. Um, if you look at uh, the highway systems in Canada, you know, they're based on um, cities. Um, and uh, so they're connected through these regions that are flat. Like you can see those lines, the 401. So <clears throat> what do these things do? These are, these are all impact scapes, you know, created by humans. So there's landscapes where, you know, the, the natural environment has like evolved. And then there's impact scapes uh, that are evolved. And, you know, like there's like, a bunch of like uh, uh, different um, species that are at risk because of these things. And even within those species, they have different um, genetic pools like caribou. Um, there's already been a lot of uh, extinct uh, caribou herds. There's a lot of uh, caribou herds, herds that are at risk. Um, and you know that could be for a lot of reasons and these are the reasons why we need to have these discussions like are these reasons because the predators can travel faster because of our impact scape are they because um you know humans um stop following the seasons and listen to uh governance so now we have september as a hunting season and, and all these fucking trophy hunters go out to hang an antler in their room you know um you know, like what seasons are uh, affect, like what, what um, calf, maybe a female, like for sure female, because males, they're so tough to skin. Their skin, like they, they just came out of a rut. All of a sudden it's winter, their skin, there's no fat. It's just meat and skin. And it's so hard to separate that. But females, they got that little bit of tunnuk. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, and it's so much easier to skin them. But at a certain time, their fetuses are a little bit too big. So now you have that conscience of um, either shooting a female seal, uh, female uh, caribou in the winter and then bringing that fetus to your biology teacher <laughs> at school or other things. So, so yeah, here we are. We're in the Great Lakes. Um, and... I'm next to a river right now, the Ottawa River, um, and it's huge. It's enormous, you know, um, and I found one spot in 45 minute walk that gives me a hundred, a hundred feet of nature. And it's like, it's actually a groomed park, you know, um, but chance for these ravens that called me here to have a nest, um, because the water fluctuates um, by the impact scape that the humans create, you know, like it's, it, it fluctuates way different than the seasons because we have locks and, and um, uh, hydro Quebec and all this kind of stuff. So that gives an opportunity for these, um, the grounds that I'm sitting on to have more uh, insect life. Um, so these are like the, um, the, 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 the environmental factors. So, when we're sitting at the Great Lakes, we got all those watersheds. Um, and I've noticed in the Canadian Shield, if you could zoom out a little bit, anything south of um, Veldor uh, feeds to the St. Lawrence River. Anything north of, the, of Veldor feeds into uh, James Bay area. Um, yeah. So like, if you look down at Toronto, that's like those huge pools are going towards Quebec city and beyond, you know, and inside that, all of those watersheds, all those mountains that we are looking at feed into this, 
So does anybody want to try to like, um, you know, explain a little bit about where they've been? Have you gone camping somewhere or something in Toronto area near the Great Lakes and talk about some of the animals you saw? And then we'll use those hints to try to consider what kind of um, plant life or fauna they had or something like were there places where them for them to nest and stuff like that so if anybody wants to talk about the last place they went camping even if it was in a groom place where uh the guy you know drops off firewood every morning or something you know like uh, anybody just stick your head out there and be a part of this conversation no dice all right city folks i'll keep talking so so now we have this understanding that in this section we have uh we have like um the two so there's like above Vildor that goes into james bay and below Vildor that goes into the great lakes and then eventually the saint lawrence river if you go right to the uh, oh sorry east <laughs> right to the to the nunatsiavu region they have a beautiful mountain region too and i have plans to to go there um uh, one day i really want to do a walk uh, um, so they have the, the really cool thing about uh, Inuit, um, and I'm going to say this like out of um, my ignorance part right so what I'm speaking about today is like a quarter of it is what the elders asked me to do a quarter of it is what my grandfather taught me to do and then half of it is um, my um, ignorance and desire to learn right and that's how life works so if you look at Nunatsiavut, there's a huge like rock face on the shore you see that it goes it goes all the way from like northern quebec down to yeah you see all that rocky region you have like and then you go down and then you have so so in Nunatsiavut, it's very beautiful that like i remember we used to have visitors from Nunatsiavut that would come and they were one of my three favorite inuit um um uh what do you call that like the different link uh dialects it was like northern quebec Nunatsiavut, and greenland those are my favorite Inuit dialects um and what was really cool is that a lot of them either came home and gave us really cool um tools to pick berries or like had really cool stories of like um hunting like we do in the north where i'm from because we're ocean people so Nunatsiavu has like two very like beautiful um, ecosystems and that's in and um, to the ocean. Uh, so those, those skills there, we really need to um, uh, emphasize and promote and support those people. Uh, I think there was, who was that beautiful lady there um, that was speaking during the seal uh seal day she had like so many beautiful um uh, stories and in fact she even mentioned one of her relatives um wanted some lunch and he's just like he threw out his fish hook you know and he comes out for his lunch and he's got a seal <laughs> you know what i mean these are the stories we have to share because maybe that's a thing you know the next time i go home during spring um i know all the little spots where the tides like create fissures and split the ice like daily and that's where we usually put our seal nets or whale nets um my cousins are gonna think i'm nuts but you know i'm definitely putting one of those strong fish hooks out there and then i'm gonna be like see like i'm a greater hunter than you you know <laughs> but it's gonna be it's gonna be thanks to the labrador inuit you know these these are the skills and knowledge um that um are transferable you know and 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 they develop they grow and 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 towards the end you know it's not just a nukeshuk we have page creating all these beautiful flyers and you know content and you know indigenous uh, presence on online you know the, these are these are all transferable skills um and we do this by having these kinds of conversations together so if you look at this part of this region of the uh Canadian um, uh, shield. I feel like we like, hopefully by the end of this, we'll come up with our own institute word, invent one for, instead of saying Canadian shield, you know? <clears throat> um, 
So yeah, like there's a huge river that goes into the northern Quebec, um, Nunavimut Inuit. Uh, there's a river right there. Oh, right there. Yeah, that river that that you're at. Go up like uh, to the right a little bit. Yeah, right a little bit. Right at the bottom. Yeah, right there. Up and down. There's a river there, right? So I think like uh, from Labrador, you could go to this place called uh, Shefferville, I think, and they're the last Niscapi people. I think their community has 1,500 people left. And uh, I, I know they speak their language. Uh, it's part, it's a derivative of the uh, Algonquin language. And uh, yeah, so these, these regions um, have like many ecosystems. So if we look at this spot, right, right where you are, and then you go to the uh, native lands map where you can look at territories, languages, and treaties, you'll see, you'll see that each region is in relationship to every one of those rivers and ecosystems. These are the traditional territories of the people. Mind you, this one's a little bit like loose because this has been built by anthropology. So they just guesstimate like what area. But if you look at all the lakes, rivers and regions um, affected by the seasons and regions um, and language, uh, you'll start to see like these territories are there. And for our, our culture, these, these were even more specific. In fact, if when I was growing up, um, even though we were all Inuit, I still looked at other settlements as a different people, even, but we spoke the same language. And there, in, the, in, these, in these relationships of all of these territories uh, of ecosystems and that um, create our etiquette and territory as a um, people that they've coined like, um, what do you call that? Oh, distinct people. Yeah, that's what they say. <clears throat> but they have beautiful skill sets. You know, so I'll give you guys an example of an etiquette of entering another territory. When I was younger, um, I was like, you know, fortunate enough, well, a blessing of a curse or a curse of a blessing to see the last semi-nomadic Inuit um, in, um, in my region. So, you know, like, like I said, I was that boy that wanted to be the greatest hunter in the world, right? And I would always want to go catch a seal so I could be like, an auntie, I care, you know, or show off to my um, elders that I know exactly what delicacy they like in their seal and give it to them and think I'm great. And my grandmother would always remind me that, you know, the nature is greater than the greatest hunters that have ever existed. You know, she would always bring the, I never understood that part. The elders would always bring me up to have such a skill level and knowledge enough for me to start thinking I'm such a great person. And then they would be like, yeah, well, you know, like at the end of the day, like nature is greater than any hunter in existence, you know, like, so we would be in these camps or in their regions. And these are families, groups of bands of Inuit that would be considered their territory or their region within my own region. Like these, what anthropology has been really good at doing is like, making this um, deficiency or removing the relationship between these regions. Like, so now Northern Quebec Inuit identify as Northern Quebec Inuit, um, you know, and, but really where the Hudson Strait is, um, I would say there's like a closer genetic and language relationships to like six communities that are actually more of the same people, but are separated because of land claims agreements, right? So <clears throat> that's the impact state. But when you look at the natural law and environment, say like, there's an elder Gula, he had a land down there um, and I would always want to catch a seal. Then later on, I learned that you would go greet yourself with these people, with all these territories. Um, and I would talk to this, he wasn't an elder then, he was just a, like one of the most epic hunters with uh, Who's that guy? He had like a Hitler mustache, old Inuk guy with Hitler mustache. And I thought that used to be funny. And I used to laugh because he probably has no idea who Hitler is, you know, <clears throat> but I would approach him and I would sit in his tent and they would always be happy that I was there. You know, I was Tikibi's grandson, you know, um, and I would talk to him and he, they would ask like little questions and, 
you know, in the end, he would, we would be talking about like what my grand, what parts of the seal my grandmother really loves. And in the end, I would ask him like, you know, like, yeah, my, my, my grandmother mentioned the other day that she needed seal meat, you know, and these knowledges happen because we have these group sessions like we're having right now. Right. And he would tell me that, yeah, over there in that region, there's about like three seals that like to stay around there, go there and, you know, get one and one from my family and bring it back, you know? And so that, that would be um, our passage to his territory. Uh, these are old etiquettes that are involved by and influenced by um, the ecosystems. And you need those people in those regions to, to, to have that very, very um, intimate relationship with that land, right? And so now I come back and I get to show off to my grandmother that I got her favorite part of the seal, you know? So, um, so yeah, so now we're not, now we've got kind of the scope of what we're trying to talk about. Um, so now we see that all of these territories are actually influenced by the ecosystem, you know? And now we have, now we have cultures, territories, languages. And then there's a part where you could just take all the, all, off all the highlights and then press the treaties. Look at all of the colors you see at that first part. And then now look at the treaties. You went from like, like thousand different shades of colors to now you have like what, four shades of colors. And those are the impact scapes that uh, disrupt this transfer of knowledge and skills. Um, and again, that's as far as I'm going to go. I don't want to go political um, or what makes people Inuk or not Inuk or indigenous or not indigenous. And this is where the impact scape starts to affect um, the conversation and, and identity and, and the platform that we're having here today. <clears throat> so um, a lot of these uh, treaties, if you want to consider um, and keep talking about impact scapes, um, have happened um, because of, uh, you know, um, the introduction of uh, constitution. So now if we look at these treaties and then we go one step further and look at like a map of Canada with all the provinces, can we do that? Look at that. Now we have 13 colors. Do you get it? Do you guys get it? And who the, who the, like, who the f am I to be healthy enough to figure out how to understand that we do have to behave within the confines of these establishments um, because we're held to help, we're here to help them too. I'm not trying to be outside of these establishments. I want to be within these establishments, um, not something outside of it, but like a part of it, you know, like Canada is a beautiful place you know like uh i like to think i can hunt but i can't support 30 million people you know so how can we involve ourselves in, within these establishments understanding these um these uh impact scapes we go from those the mountainous region the first mountainous region we saw was like you know and i was talking about like the, the, the topography map and then we saw all of those like ecosystems which is way more colorful than um, our territories. Like there's, you know, like um, just a variant of like, I don't know, 50 feet high or uh, just a variant of like two degrees Celsius. You have a completely different ecosystem. Add a, add a riverbed in there, add a lake bed in there, add a swamp in there. These are very, very, um, you know, fundamental practices of understanding your idea of environment and what is your relationship to it right these are these are very important because that that becomes your identity um, and and our identity and and this idea of um environment is not limited to um just uh thinking about the ecosystem because now we're looking at a map of canada and you have to the environment changes from the natural world to a constituted construct in your mind of, hey, I'm, you know, 
uh, an Ontarian, you know, or I'm I'm Inuk from Nunavut, you know, I'm 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 Labrador mute. But they're also very important, and and I and I like that people acknowledge that because um, when when Brian was speaking in, in his introduction, he was saying that like uh, I'm a beneficiary of the Nunatsiavut land claims agreement, you know, that told me that he acknowledges and is he's aware of the constituted idea of um, this ethnic identity and that's powerful and we need to start understanding what that means and transfer it and have this discussion amongst each other um, today when I you know if, if I went to and I'm gonna say this out loud and you you know you, you can get like I'll get hateful remarks and the cool thing is like you know I don't I don't have to have a title of you know, being a director or anything. So I could say this, if I go to any community within the Nunavut um, land claims agreement, I would say less than, less than like 40% of the Inuit know what it means to be a beneficiary of the Nunavut land claims agreement. Do you get it? It's, uh, and these agreements were made before me. And then I start understanding them. And I'm like, hey, wait, fuck that. That's not me, man. <laughs> you know, like I got laws and rights and understandings of using land and and, and, and and relationships between territories within my own people. Then also further to other regions and territories of other people. You know, so, <clears throat> but um, That's why, like, you know, I have, you know, some beefs about this idea of decolonization, all that kind of stuff, because, like, um, yeah, we, the best thing we can do um, is stop talking this far, because I promised that we're not going to get into um, governance and, um, and, uh, and what really is relationships of being Inuk. Um, so I'll move back. I'll back up a little bit because uh, it's easy to light my fire. Um, if we could go scroll back down, <laughs> if we could scroll back down, besides my sister has the poster behind her that represents what I'm really talking about. <laughs> uh, if we go back down to James Bay area and then, uh, look at just light the treaty, uh, sorry, the light, the territories and turn off everything else. And then scroll in more towards James Bay. Um, uh, more down, more down towards the creek, bottom, bottom left of James Bay. Look at that, Wait, that Moose Cree. Look at that. That's a fucking huge territory. Now, if you go to the topography map and you look at the same spot, yo, you're killing it, Paige. Just zoom in there. Yeah, that's too far. That's like way behind the confines of establishment. Go. <laughs> <laughs> so you go back let's see here keep going that's still in the confines <laughs> um <clears throat> so if you look at that area we were looking at of the the cree the moose cree look how intricate that territory is look at all those watersheds those water systems do you know how knowledgeable these people have to be if you zoom out a little bit more, that river's too big. Get all the little rivers, all the little veins. Because their territory, that, that whole territory was the Cree. And within that territory, how many camps and trap lines did they have? You know, and how many groups and bands of Cree did they have? And variants of their, variants of their, uh... sorry, the weather's like letting me know he's here. Um... The, um, if you look at like all the, 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 such a huge territory, you can only imagine how many bands of people they had. Um, and the knowledge they had with that huge section of, uh, rivers, lakes, and oceans. Um, how did they travel through, uh, through, through, through the seasons, you know? Um, it's really cool. I actually had a chance uh, a couple months ago to be on the other side of James Bay. Uh, in Wiminji, and I had a chance to, um, because of some of the expeditions that I want to do um, for uh, knowledge transfer, I got to sit down with a couple um, uh, Crees 
and look at maps and some of the projects that they're doing to try to identify um, traditional trap lines and traditional regions and camps and stuff like that. And I began to see how the Cree see all these huge river systems, like they're highways. Um, it's easy to say that from looking at a map, but I'm pretty sure if I was on the river, I'd get lost and like probably spend a couple years stuck somewhere because of the seasons or probably starve to death to be real. But like, <clears throat> I want to pretend, you know, this is a storytelling too. But yeah, so these, these folks, um, so what I inferenced when I was talking to one of them was like, whoa, I could read this map. You know, I'm, I'm seeing what you're showing me. Like I can imagine the Cree would go down the river during spring breakup and follow the geese and hunt. And then during fall, they would start coming back up. And then, and then their winter camps and their summer, their summer camps would be closer to the ocean, which is cool. And depending on which cycle they're at of their, um, their, their, their culture or their, their practice, they would mix with Inuit using their cultures. Like how sick is that? You know, like these, were the transferable skills and knowledge. You know, I, I always thought when I was young and my, my grandfather would tell me how the Cree make their geese. And I always, I, I never understood how he would know that. There was no emails. There was no like, I don't know. There was no newspapers or like, but then, you know, later on when I got older, I realized, yeah, these cycles and uh, nomadic lifestyles that people had meant that they had like times and two different nations would share a lake and fish and gather, you know, and probably a snag, you know, some fish. Um, so, <laughs> but, you know, that's how these knowledges and stories were, were shared. And then, you know, eventually it would go all the way up to my part of the world, which I can only imagine that some of these stories would probably take like a generation maybe or two to make it to my region of the north you know by then they would be legends and stories that's why legends and stories are so important you know that's when we we're um working yesterday's workshop and writing skills um i wrote a piece about the intimacy of an ulu i would have never i would have never been able to articulate that in any other space you know and that's why stories and legends become very important and I brought a slingshot, but now there's an old white guy over there. There's seagulls around me. I hate them. <clears throat> yeah, I probably shouldn't, like, shoot them with a pebble. <clears throat> I think you should. It would be... Okay, I'm going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like seagulls. They're so... I don't know. Where is it? There it City is. dwellers. Yeah. Well, he's looking at the water anyways. All right. I'm not using a rock. It's just a piece of cork. Like, it's a wood. So, like, I'm not killing them. But I am going to tell them to fuck off. Oh, he thought it was food. <laughs> All right. That didn't work. So, where were we? Um, transferable skills and knowledge. Uh, am I starting to make sense? Can someone try to, like, who's listening? I'm, I'm tired of talking. Um, and this is supposed to be a community thing, you know. This is this is how we this is how we discuss stuff, and and now it's your chance to apply what you think you understand of the conversations that we had, um, because people are not really coming out and speaking. Um, Christine, you want to say what's up to Montreal and say like some of the work that you're working on and um, how this conversation has um, struck any like have struck anything inside you? Christine, you're on. Yeah, I was I was actually listening to you while I was um, working. I'm uh, I'm in Montreal j jogging. I'm working on a food security program for our community members, um, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit. And I feel like I'm very comfortable in my listening role because I've I've been very disconnected from the north. Although I have lived one year up north uh, in Kuturapik. Um I haven't really been out on the land. And yeah, it's nice to hear what you have to say about relationship to land and connection with communities and with elders and just having, 
um, just hearing how approachable it is to go see elders and to talk to them and to not feel like I don't know enough so I, I feel too shy to go and see them to talk about it like it feels good to hear you say like that you are able like very comfortably to just go see your elders and talk with them and to just learn from them and to yeah have these discussions so thank you you also have like an opportunity to get bring them information you know so what i'm asking is like within your community in montreal like um you said you're working on security pro projects and stuff like that but like um how are you communicating with your community in montreal um lately like are you zooming or like um do you have like scheduled like times where you meet with people um like how is that how, how are the transferable skills and knowledge is like um happening with within your kind of relationship to your community yeah so once in a while i'll um i'll bring my um grocery gift cards that i go distribute to the community members and it really shows that they're happy to see community because even within my line of work right now we're doing all of our work through the phone mostly and through zoom uh, but with community members mostly like on the phone once in a while i'll see them like social distance like we'll talk together um but it's very it's for a very short amount of time um but yeah i feel like it's not as easy to go to see community members and to just spend an hour with them and talk with them um because there's like fear for social distancing like ever like everyone at work is super like like uh stressed out and things like that um but yeah it does make me think that um yeah we we could like put a time at work and not at work even among community members to just have a zoom meeting and just talk instead of just focusing on on like uh, survival of indigenous and Inuit in Montreal, like we can just debrief and talk and yeah, transfer knowledge. So, yeah, very technologically centered. That's, that's beautiful. I, I'm glad you mentioned some of those stressors. There's words in the Institute that uh, I call katamanaktu. These are things that keep you down. So when you have these stressors and um, you have like uh, these embarrassments or shyness or the idea that um, judgment and stuff like that, um, resentment, um, you know, disgrace or whatever, you know, when I was growing up, um, I, there's still a few elders still alive today and they'll be making fun of me for something I said when I was like five years old, you know, and these, these practices weren't to bring someone down, you know, like they were like, you know, making fun of like the ignorance, you know, I told you half of it is my drive and curiosities from my ignorance, you know? So um, these are very good practices that you're talking about. And, um, you know, like I, I honor the feelings that, that you, you appreciate when you um, know the uh, capacity to observe these uh, relationships or interpersonal relationships within your community. And that makes you very um, uh, important to, 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 uh, to practice um, um, how to be with, with those feelings inside you. Um, it's really good that uh, we have people like you and, um, and that we as Inuit, we get a chance here today through the Toronto Inuit Association to have these discussions and, um, and not have this expert model. You know, like we're like, yeah, we, we don't have that feeling. This is how we are. Like this is exactly, exactly what it's going to be like even though in the constituted world that we saw in that map, we do have to behave like that, you know? Um, but within our community, um, it's going to be really important for us to, um, to understand that um, it's very difficult for our uh, skills and knowledge and our desire to help our community when we have these feelings, you know, like for myself, um, it's been really difficult you know, like uh, facing homelessness, prison, um, and all this kind of stuff during these times that like stop us from actually transferring these relationships that we want with our community. You know, it's so easy to, um, to, 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 to displace people now. And I think 
that's the that's the formula that has happened from the ecosystems that we saw to the um, to 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 the um, indigenous territories that we saw to the treaties that we saw to the constitution that we saw that created the provinces and that's how these um, these these formulas of um, displacement um, work you know and uh, we we as uh, Inuit in this case and um, our friends who are on with us today uh, we have an opportunity to have these fundamental discussions um, and being open not to um, be the expert model you know but rather what we bring to this identity this collective conscience that is Inuit you know um, I think last time when me and Brian were talking you know Brian had to speed check me he's a really good boss like I, I I'm so glad he's in his position because we need somebody with pillars in their identity like that. And um, Paige and Brian and I had a chat last week to kind of uh, consider the um, the um, uh, boundaries of this conversation. And um, it was really cool because I think what we signed off with uh, was saying that you can't be an Inuk without Inuit. And I think that was our our final, we're like, okay, fuck, we got it. Let's like just shoot for it. But it's true. So as much as I identify as being Inuk, which is an individual, um, I cannot be an Inuk without you guys, Inuk, you know? And so with you guys, I become a part of my, my identity becomes a part of a collective conscience. And so those feelings that you're having, I feel them too. Um, absolutely. Um, and we acknowledge them. So now we need to consider what kind of skills, um, now that we have the knowledge of these feelings are in our community, what kind of skills can we bring? And Paige is doing a really good job. She's the Inukshuk lady. <laughs> She's like putting these posters up and, um, and gathering us and directing us into these beautiful uh, opportunities to have a conversation and learn. Um, and then Brian is doing a great job to make sure that um, his Inuit have a space, you know? I'm like, hey, Brian, like, you want to introduce yourself? He's like, yeah, I'll let my guys talk. And then Simon goes on and he talks and he shows what he's doing. Thank you, Simon, for doing that. Like, that, that makes me feel really good that, you know, you use your capabilities to be involved in the identity of other people, regardless if they're Inuk or not. So this, my friends, is the transferable skills and knowledge um, and environment. So... Um, does anybody else want to try their um, idea or expression of what I said? And I'm going to make it uncomfortably quiet and we're going to waste minutes if nobody says anything. I'd be happy to talk, but I also want to let other people talk too. Is there anybody else that wants to share? Maybe share why you're here today. Yeah. <laughs> you should ask your question there. Okay. I don't know, Kevin, if you see the chat. <clears throat> yeah, there is a, in the chat, I wrote a couple things. Um, I had a question from like quite a bit earlier and then I also, I think it ties into my, my question that I just typed there. It's basically like, it's kind of known that Inuit are pretty shy, um, <laughs> including myself. So I'm wondering like, you were speaking about how you would just go speak to different elders or speak to your family and want to learn from them, but also want to like show what you learned. So I'm wondering for like people that don't have that, like I know in Toronto, I have my brother, but he's pretty much the only family here, uh, Inuit family here. So like, who do you go to for that? And how do you stop being shy? <laughs> and like, ask those questions. You're on mute. Kevin, you've got to unmute yourself. So yeah, so that's, that's part of my identity and it hurts because I, because I don't, 
I don't. Um, I've worked with like suicide intervention. I've worked with like elders and, um, you know, once they find out that um, I'm aware and I was there um, and I was raised like that, the elders I'm talking about, and I get them into these beautiful deep discussions of philosophies and fundamental ideas and um, inferences about like what it might mean to be in that kind of an ecosystem, regardless if it's in your mind or your uh, physical environment. Um, you know, you get to a certain point and it's like, let's pray to Jesus. And I fucking catch on fire. Like, I, fuck. <clears throat> There's other times too where, uh, you know, like these great Inuit organizations um, and representatives, you know, speak of the future of Inuit. And a lot of the programs um, have, you know, criteria that exclude this opportunity to transfer the skills and knowledge, you know, um, because the programs and fundamental monies and capabilities that they offer um, push you further into the, uh, the institutional setting. So I, I don't I don't have that space. We don't have, like, we're all feeling this, you know, and um, it's so easy. Like, I, I grew up in a time where I would observe someone speaking to me and I could tell if they're from a place of people who hunt walrus, who have, like, um, you know, like, they probably hunt, like, in Kimmerut, they they have a better chance of getting their whales in spring or like I came from that world thinking that's exactly like I couldn't wait to be that person to today when I talk to someone I, I gotta try to figure out what department they're from you know um, and then and then there and so that so that um, that creation of um, governance um, creates a criteria for um, for access and it becomes really difficult for, for me um, and for a long time I was really upset with the way organizations that represent Inuit are behaving and then now that I've come to understand um, that uh, the only way to meet the monies that they offer is to become an organization and meet the criteria as yourself. And then I start realizing, oh, fuck, like I've been upset with this Inuit organization for years only to realize that they have to behave in a certain way to have access. So now, like, <clears throat> um, I feel most of the time I feel completely alone. Um, I feel completely removed. Um, you know, those stressors that I face with like being in a, um, being in a charter case with Palais Justice Quebec, um, and then being, um, um, identified as like, uh, the only like institutional qualification I have is a criminal record. <laughs> How the fuck is that gonna help me? You know, like right there, it um, displaces me and removes me, um, and it becomes an identity within um, the constituted um, ethnic identity of an Inuit. You know, it removes me completely. So, <clears throat> like, how 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 can I how can I do it? Well, let's uh, maybe we could watch another video before we end. Um, uh, because these uh, chances of transferring these skills are uh, a little bit different and um, I challenge these criteria of what an Inuk is supposed to be you know so maybe we could watch Igloo Fest from MTL Blurb and uh, 
I guarantee you all the fucking elders are going to think I'm the devil. So <clears throat> wake up. Let's go. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think before that we could uh, let Simon jump in? Sure. Simon, jump in. Say something. Um, I like what I like about what I like about earlier, like you said, uh, you can't be an Inuk without being around other Inuit people. I really like that quote. And like uh, meeting through this virtual meetings kind of re really helps me because at least I'm not alone here and there's other people out there in the world, different cities. And also like uh, what I learned something new today is that these like, little landscapes, those are pretty interesting. I didn't know nothing about it. That's what I learned from this group today. And like uh, all your stories, and like they're pretty interesting. Like I really like them. So cool. And and like uh, I like like early years. Uh, like I said, being around other Inuit people, you can't be an Inuit. Like, that's the best quote I got today. It just made my day today. And thank you. Yeah, we, we had the same reaction, like me and Brian, but because like we're all so scared not to say the right thing or be the right person, like even though we were like, whoa, that's like such a cool, dope thing to say, like you can't be an Inuk without Inuit right away because of our own traumas. Brian's like, oh, but wait, we have to be careful because like right now everyone's isolated. We don't want to trigger people to feeling excluded. These are the exact things that stop this transfer of skills and knowledge to the environment and and in order to the environment is sila like here and the idea of your consciousness is sila tunel you know and that's and that's like how vast is the expansion uh, expanse of environment in your mind you know so it, it, they, they come from both the same derivative so that tells us that when we look at nature and all these ecosystems and how it behaves, um, these same formulas are in our identity, just different variables, you know? So yeah, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's, let's, let me, let's see what an urban Inuk looks like and watch the next video called the uh, Igloo Fest. Check it out. I promise I fail. <laughs> Happy Aboriginal Day, everyone. Aboriginal? I don't like that term. What does that even mean? I think it means you're abnormal. Yo, well, it's better than Happy Indian Day. What, I'm supposed to like Happy Indian Day? <laughs> <laughs> Montreal, Montreal is so, so Aboriginal? Native? Indigenous? If this cupcake represents 150 years of Canada, and this cake represents 375 years of Montreal, then this big ass cake, cake represents the over 8,000 years that indigenous people have been inhabiting this very land. To celebrate, I wanted to put some LED lights on my igloo. I even got a quote from Moment Factory, but that shit was expensive. Did you offer them some pelts? Yeah, they weren't into it. Settlers. You know, Westerners still consider themselves Westerners, right? They're still lost because, like, they still haven't realized they came from the East. <laughs> I'm like, you're still f***ing lost. They're not Westerners, they're Easterners. We're not Indians, so I mean, like, <laughs> just proves how bad at geography they are. Shout out to my Indian brothers from India. Hey guys, my name is Kevin Tikovic and I'm from Michalit Nunavut. My name is Jennifer Jerome. I'm Mi'kmaq woman from Giska Pigia, Quebec. My name is Wayne Robinson. I'm Ojibwe from Pick River First Nations. And you're watching MDL Blur. What makes Montreal so indigenous is that you have people from all over Canada who are also indigenous living in Montreal. Mickinacs are not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> the three of us represent three separate indigenous nations. And we all made it here to Montreal. Traditionally, Mohawk territory in honor of the Mohawk people. We got the Mohawks down. <laughs> this one's for the Mohawks. First of all, quit grinning like an idiot. Indians ain't supposed to smile like that. Get stoic. Don't you even know how to be a real Indian? I guess not. Being indigenous means more than being a stereotype. I don't live in a bush. I live in a city. I love going to spas. 
I don't know what you're talking about half the time. Why is that? And I can go shopping and I whip out my status card because I want to save that $2. Yeah, two bucks, I don't care. You're Indian? I feel like I got the color here. I look the part. But I know both of you can outpower me. Both of you can survive in the bush longer than me. Uh, I don't think so. I can. I got nails. That's okay. I I can try to feed both of you. I still have my hunting knife right here. Dude, dude, you're gonna get us arrested. <laughs> I can still read the weather. I can still hear the crows using trigonometry to find their way. I can look at a bush and tell you what size the animal was that ate it. Like I still understand this stuff, but it's confusing because I'm light skinned and I live in a city. The fact is we're here today. We're your neighbors, we're your colleagues. That being said, non-indigenous millennial people, if I catch you at Oceaga wearing a headdress again, I will curse your ass. If you're allowed to wear a headdress at a festival, then I'm allowed to come in dressed as a priest and whoop your ass. <laughs> So the point is, we're just like everyday Montrealers. Just like it says on the back of your license plate, we haven't forgotten our past. Because we know where we've been and we know where we're going. Je me souviens. I remember. A lot of people will tell us, get over it. Well, I'm sorry. Genocide, you don't get over it. You have to take the time to heal. We love one another. We support one another. We respect Mother Earth. We are Mother Earth. We are all connected one way or another. And Aboriginal Day is not just one day. It's 365 days a year. Yeah, that, that wasn't the one I wanted to see, but that was good too. I wanted to see the Igloo Fest one, but uh, I don't know if like Tia is like Hi. down with that one. <laughs> you shared the wrong one. <laughs> oh, okay. So I just can uh, I do it? I wonder. Oh, I don't know. It's too complicated. It's it's uh, Igloo Fest, MTL blurb Igloo Fest. That's the one I wanted to see. That's like specific to Inuit. So if you know how to put it up quickly, that'll be really, really funny. But that was good too. I think like, do you, do you get like how you could transfer these little, you know, skills and knowledges and you see how difficult it is for me from the, your last question, we had this whole two hour conversation to kind of just scratch the surface. And then you see the reality of how, how, how fucking hard it is for us to transfer that skill and knowledge. And then I do it in a video like that and it just hints, but at least it helps other Inuit grasp like some kind of identity, you know? And um, yeah, I got my hunting knife right here. <laughs> so yeah, Igloo, could you put on Igloo Fest? That one's kind of funnier. Uh, and that goes against like, you know, Inuit aren't supposed to drink or party or do this. Like, man, like anyone who says that, they don't know what's up in Toronto. Anyone who says that, they don't know what's up in Montreal. They're like, I'm not promoting that, but like we have to stop giving Inuit a criteria because of like some of the social economic issues that we have, you know? So now they're going to, you know, they, they put out like, Hey, this is wellness. And if you don't like, Oh, if you know, like th they'll ostracize people, you know, instead of like, Hey, like this is like Christine, we came out and she said like, this is some of the challenges I'm having. And I'm like, wow. Okay. That's, that's, that's the reality that um, we need to start having and discuss at the same time respecting the confines of the organization you know because like there are some terminologies and criteria that we have to follow and respect and i in that i'm gonna thank tia but yeah let's put up igloo fest is it easy yeah yeah i found it um I oh mean, my god indigenous you guys are gonna think i'm crazy like uh <laughs> it was also accurate but let's uh share this here we go. Igloo fest, Inuhati. More like igloo fail, 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 fail. Am I right? What's up with the Yetis? And what's up with the Japanese beer? You know I'm not Japanese, right? What's up with the 80s style onesies? Way to make a guy in seal skin feel out of place. Seal skin onesie. An answer, Kulitaro will not ping up here to me. Igloo Fest seems like it's become another overindulgent, overly corporatized, sensory abomination. So obviously, 
I got my ticket right here. <laughs> Yo, check it out. This is Kevin Tikovic's pro tips for Igloo Fest. Igloo Fest pro tip number one. Leave your hunting knives at home. Trust me, I learned the hard way. I know, I don't understand why either. I couldn't even bring my utility knife. What you gotta do is settle for the glow stick. What the f do I catch with this? Yo. Pro tip number two, dress appropriately. I'm sure you look great in a skirt. I'm sure some of you look amazing in skinny jeans. I know some of you don't have that access to getting good seal skin products like I do, but dress warm, kids. Pro tip number three, never accept anything from a stranger and know your limits. I guess that's kind of three and four. Handle your shit. Don't indulge in what you can't handle. And be careful, there's enough drugs out there like fentanyl that's gonna put you directly with your creator. Pro tip number five, igloo festers. Igloo festers? Yo, this year, if you catch yourself getting frostbitten at igloo fest, before you go inside and meet the warm air, you need to melt snow on the affected area. I promise you, you'll thank me for it. By the way, if you didn't know, Inuit have been having sick parties for thousands of years, bringing communities together, eating together, dancing together, drumming together. Sounds pretty cool, right? No wonder, here in Montreal, we have Igloo Fest. So remember that when you're partying this year, it's about your spirit, it's about your soul, it's about how you connect to nature, it's about how you receive each other, it's about how you live with one another in harmony. In the end, we should think of Igloo Fest as a tribute to all Inuit and all the facets of Inuit culture. Yo, it's cool that you're appropriating my culture and everything. Here's a simple way to alleviate the associated guilt. Buy me a shot, will you? Buy me two. Let's go all out. Wow. Igloo Fest. <laughs> this is Kevin Akalaja Tikovic. Keep binge watching MTL Blurb. So I'm gonna put this shit right here. And I'm gonna Igloo Fest. What? Yeah, so, um, <laughs> what's up? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, so, so now you see how difficult it is to, um, to answer that question you had. Where do you go? What do you do to, um, talk to an elder or, um, have these moments where you get to, um, deliberate your your experience and your identity um and uh not be affected by the criteria that um is constituted to you you know um so yeah that's a party scene but somewhere in there you learn a few things um and you know they had to put a disclaimer but like really when you get frostbite when you're out hunting you like melt the snow on the frostbite part first before you go inside because it's not going to stop the frostbite. Like, look, you already got the frostbite, buddy. But it's going to fucking burn when you go inside the house. When you go back into the warm air, it's going to burn. So you have to melt snow on your cheek or your cheeks or whatever frostbitten area before you go inside so that it doesn't burn when you get into the warm air. Like, because it really hurts and stings. Um, you know, um, also, like, it's a really watered-down version where I, I ask people to, you know... Um, look at these kinds of appropriations and um you know understand all the facets facets of being in it um which you know we've learned today that um it's it's like a collective identity so <clears throat> yeah and then um because of the way uh the authoritarian approach that's been introduced into us today you know um somebody will focus on the fact that I'm drinking, you know, because these um, social issues are now a profession, you know? So now um, it's going to be like, oh, that's against our wellness is killing our community and rah, 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 rah. But like, why is, why are those um, impact scapes there within our environments, you know? Um, so yeah, like, uh, we're almost closing up. I just want to ask if, um, cause it's always hard to, to speak to a world where they want a definition that's like complete and like, you know, a still frame, like it's like right here, 
you know. But as we've learned today, um, uh, as Inuit and people and the um, the Great Canadian Shield, um, identity is not a still frame, you know. Um, it, our territories aren't a still frame, um, but we can look at areas um, that are um, that affect our communities and eth ethics and um, and our communication <clears throat> naturally, or uh, you know we could look at impact scapes. But I just want to say that um, Inuit, I thank you guys very much. Um, you're doing a very good job. Um, like I, I'm going to say this in a way where it reveals quite a bit, but you know, from what I know, because I keep my air out, I, I'm very protective of Inuit. The Toronto Inuit Association started because you can't put these transferable skills and knowledge and environments under one umbrella, you know, like sure. Um, I'm not going to say other organizations out of respect but um eventually the toronto Indian association realized that hey we need our own setup here you know and so look at that like how how long has it been only like three years and you guys are the front of everything that's going on with Indian right now what's up like that that's that's the crazy part so this is why we need to have these like uh, discussions like, for sure, you guys lit a fire in Montreal. They're like, oh, fuck, we got to be doing something big, you know? Like, and now, instead of, you know, we've realized today that we're not trying to up each other. Now, it's like Toronto Inuit, reach out, you know, or Montreal Inuit, reach out, you know? I'm always here um, to have, you know, counsel with my fellow Inuit. Um, so, yeah, like, what are some of the cool things that we can learn Um and share with each other and and uh, bring that confidence. So in that, if anybody wants to do a closing, uh, it's kind of perfect. The weather's coming in, the wind's picking up. Um, this Eskimo is cold. <laughs> um, I hope that you guys learned something today um, and that you guys realize it's a lens um, and not a definition. So if anybody wants to take over and say what's up, I'm down. Awesome. Thanks so much, Kevin. Nakamik. Um, I don't know what to say. It's all been so, so amazing. Thank you, Christine, for clapping. <laughs> That's a good way to show how we all felt about this today. Um, I feel like we as Inuit learned so much and also you were very open about what you shared so that non-Inuit could also participate and learn. Um, it was cool to see like not just Ontario where we are right now, well some of us are right now, but all the way through the Canadian Shields and uh, I think it'd be great if we came up with a name for that in an institute. It'd be really really fun. Um, yeah, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> Brian, do you have any final words? Uh, sure, yeah. I just want to say Nakamik to Kevin. Thank you so much for um, providing all of this for us today. It was, it was a great conversation. It was a great explanation of, um, yeah, the ecosystem, micro ecosystems, uh, impact scapes, really interesting stuff. Um, so thanks everyone for attending and uh, yeah, get inside Kevin before the weather comes down uh, and have a great weekend, everybody. I'll come in. Thank you.